I've gone through so many phases of like being okay with it and then not being okay with it and then being okay with it again. And the not being okay with it stuff all comes from, I guess, really being young. Like I was born in the 90s, so everyone wanted to be skinny in the 90s and having a fat kid was like, oh, something's gone wrong here. And I recall so many conversations between adult family members about me and my body when I was like literally like in primary school, you know, and how are we going to make her skinny? What are we going to do? And um, everyone tried whatever they could, but I'm still fat. So <laughs> I just, I kind of feel like even though there's so many moments in my life where I have wanted to exist not in this body just to make my life easier, I've kind of come to terms with the fact now that I think I just was meant to exist in this fat body. Kia ora. I'm Sasha Borisenko and this is Chewing the Facts, a podcast about fatness. In this series, I'll be talking with people about their experiences, experts, government officials and industry representatives. At the heart of it, I'll be attempting to untangle some of the science, history and forces behind fatness in Aotearoa. I'm a journalist with a keen interest in law and social issues. I've had a pretty unhealthy relationship with my body since my teens. I was a fat kid. I remember doctors asking if I ate too many lollies when I was asking for asthma medication, not making the cut on sports teams, avoiding shopping, and dating never being in the realm of possibility. Cue the diet years. Eliminating delicious bread for a summer would mean I suddenly realised the harsh reality of being deemed more palatable by society. It bummed me out. Mums would ask what my secret was. Little would they know I'd be hiding a harmful relationship with food for the next 10 years. The over-exercise would lead to four knee operations, a torn hamstring and a lifetime's worth of tiger balm. In a thinner body, no doctor or health professional asked whether I ate too many lollies or questioned the nature of my injuries. I'm Pākehā, middle class, and I've had the resources to diet and exercise. I've fasted on edamame beans and porridge twice a week. Mm. I've embarrassed myself at Zumba. And I've tried 99% sugar-free, fat-free, happiness-free, barcha-flavoured protein drinks. I'm currently straight-sized. That's a term used by the fashion industry to describe being able to buy clothes at mainstream chain stores and one I'll be using throughout the series. And I'm sometimes fat. I've often been confused as to why there's a societal pressure to keep trying to be a bag of bones. Why is it so hard to digest you can be both healthy and fat? Britain is too fat and is getting fatter, and doing nothing is not an option. Obesity in America. It's something we don't like talking about, but it's hard to ignore. Let's face it, we're getting fat. In fact, it's... What does healthy even mean? And if fatness comes down to poor personal choices or a lack of willpower, whose business is it whether you jazzercise or eat lettuce leaves or not? Framing fatness as a health issue resulting from poor decisions seems to eclipse debate around who's profiting from this so-called obesity epidemic. We've heard for so long that fatness is the cause of most of our biggest health problems, that for many of us it's taken as red. But a lot of the science and policy behind this obesity epidemic doesn't quite add up. More importantly, Why is there a reluctance to accept that fat stigma is a rights issue, a a human rights issue? Because when it comes to accessing healthcare or just basic human dignity, the humanity of fat people seems to go by the wayside. This podcast is as much about trying to get my head around the science, politics and conflicting information as it is to highlight the voices of people bearing the brunt of these belief systems. How do we talk about this stuff in a meaningful way and without causing harm? Frankly, I don't know. I recognise too that my experience of the world is very different and inconsequential compared with others. First up though, we need to discuss terminology. Is fat the right word to be using? For Fern, it's okay. 
the word fat is such a weird one because in my like 30-ish years on the planet, it's changed its meaning so drastically. Back in the day, it was like a bad thing for someone to call you fat. But now, like I identify comfortably as fat because that is actually just what it is. Like there is fat on my body. <laughs> it's, fine. it's fine. Like I am fat. I hate when people like, if people are ever trying to discuss my body in front of me, which they do, like shockingly, um, all the time, friends and everything. Um, they will try and like tiptoe around, like saying it. And I'll be like, oh, you mean I can't go to that shop because I'm fat? Like, it's, like, fine. Like, I know what we're... Like, I know I can't go to that shop. Like, be okay to talk about it. Like, it's kind of weird that you're happy to talk to me about everything else in the world except for, like, me, you know? Some people get uncomfortable saying fat. But why? Is it the word or how it's used that's the issue? Whether it's tiptoeing around it or using it as a slur, whatever the situation, there's an underlying assumption about fatness going on. It's people are uncomfortable when they hear something like that, like the word fat. They're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know. Should I, should I, should I like apologize almost? Or should I change the word? Or should I be outraged that you're using a, a word that's accurate or a word that I've deemed to be negative or have this different kind of power and you're reclaiming it in this different way? Like, should I be mad about that? That's Ash Gillen, a PhD candidate, research fellow and lecturer at the University of Auckland. Her background is in Indigenous health studies. She identifies as fat. You know, we do label those who are different. We label the other, right? So it's going to be the fat person. It's not going to be the straight-sized or thin actress, right? It's going to be the black woman, not the white man, you know? Like, it's all we always label other. So in that way, labelling in that kind of situation can be harmful. But there's a fine line between are we denying that this person occupies these identities, which are often minoritized, or are we just, you know, perpetuating other stuff? It's a fine line, and I think one of the best ways to do it is really be led by the person. Like I walked in here, and I said, "I'm a fat wahine Māori." If you were going to start calling me like a plus size or curvy, you know, something else, I'd be like, mm, "That's not what I actually said." It makes sense, right? If you think about the term overweight, you're implying there's an ideal weight to start with, and everything outside of that is not okay. What about the use of the word obesity? When we get so hung up on using the word fat, like, it creates further problems for people. And, you know, talking about people as obese or overweight really is just a way to kind of further stigmatise them and to desensitise ourselves from their issues. You know, it puts the distance between those in power and those who have become powerless through that labelling. Here's Leslie Gray. She's a health researcher from the University of Otago. Her PhD looks at disaster risk for stigmatised and marginalised groups. Some people might call it the O word, or some people will just avoid using that term. And the reason is it's a very unliked term and it's very medical centred. And so obesity is equal to diseased body. So actually calling somebody obese is, is a really negative term. Here's where it gets complicated. In 1997, the World Health Organization, or the WHO for short, declared obesity as a major public health problem in a global pandemic. Two years later, the UN agency classified obesity as a disease. Here's Indigenous health researcher Ash Gillen again. There's the underlying assumption, particularly with fatness, that you can fix the fat. You can choose not to be fat. You can decide to Work hard, right, the myth of meritocracy, and fix yourself because that's how you've been assigned as unwell and therefore unworthy, undeserving. A lot of uns. On the one hand, the WHO classification of obesity as a disease recognises fatness isn't just a matter of personal choice, which we'll be looking closely at in episode two. But then there's also the issue that to say your body is diseased isn't great either. Well, we know as obesity researchers that obesity is a disease, but the fact that the American Medical Association has recognized it will have tremendous impact on legislation in Washington, with insurance companies. It carries a lot of weight. 
It wasn't too long ago when fatness was a sign of wealth and opulence. We see fat bodies represented as a status symbol in Renaissance paintings, for example. This changed in the 20th century, where now it's considered a pandemic. But why? Here's Professor George Bray. Coined one of the fathers of obesity research, his work set the stage for the first International Congress on Obesity in 1974. I remember one time my professor and I were having lunch together and he says, why are you working on the field of obesity? It's something that's only the quacks work on. So I've been, I guess, the anti-quack in the field trying to, trying to provide some academic rigor to it. The concern about obesity actually goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. The life insurance providers were aware that people who were overweight tended to have higher death rates. And then after the war, people began to take it more seriously as communicable diseases began to decline. The non-communicable diseases like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer begin to increase. The dangers to health resulting from overweight have been shown convincingly by life insurance records. Life expectancy decreases as the amount of overweight increases. Consumption of calories in excess of body needs is the single most extensive nutritional problem affecting public health in this country. There's a couple of things going on here. There's a recognition that academic fields are fairly recent and evolving, which raises the question, could everything we know about obesity be wrong? When the WHO classified obesity as a disease in 1999, it was described as complex, serious, chronic, and incompletely understood. Fatness has only been actively measured since the 1970s. The tool, the body mass index, stems from a history of insurance companies trying to create a universal system to measure risk. So from day dot, there's been a link between fatness and health risks, which perhaps explains this fixation with health and weight. This is the amount of fat in that whole pizza. Despite healthy eating campaigns, the report says people are dying from avoidable diseases caused by obesity, such as diabetes, heart disease and cancer. Obesity by itself is associated with a number of complications, diabetes, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, heart disease, etc. It was in 1942 when the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company compiled age, weight and mortality numbers from almost 5 million policies in North America to establish height and weight charts. The index identified what was the most desirable weight, making no mention of race, gender or age. And so it was. The ideal body type was officially born. The further people move outside the ideal, they pay more in premiums. It's the nature of the money-making insurance game, right? It's also important to think about the sample of people used for these numbers. It's rich people who have always been able to access insurance. More on the body mass index, or BMI for short. It's a basic way that fat is measured on the body. It gives you a score that tells you whether you're in a range of being underweight, healthy, overweight, obese, or severely obese. The WHO deems a BMI of 25 plus as overweight, or 35 plus as obese. Here's health equity researcher Leslie Gray again. The body mass index was actually created about 200 years ago with a Belgian mathematician called Quetelet. And uh, Quetelet was a sociologist as well as a mathematician and came up with this population mean. So in other words, the ideal population mean. Now, bear in mind that a Belgian mathematician 200 years ago, they meant a white person mean. And the people that were measured were principally European white male persons. And so that becomes problematic straight away in that um, many women were not even included in that measure and certainly people of colour were not represented there. And then if we roll forward to about the 1972, I think it was, 
there was a, another bunch of people who re-looked at these population measures and came up with the body mass index. Now, Quaitlet never intended for the body mass index to be used as an individual proxy of health. It was just a population me, a population average type of thing. So it was never intended to be used in the way that it has been used since the early 70s. Not only is the BMI dubious historically, it also isn't very accurate. It varies wildly when we look at race, gender and age, for example. In June, the American Medical Association came out swinging against the BMI, saying it wasn't only racist, but it was misleading about how body size affects death rates. And yet, it's very much used today to form the basis of local and international health policy. For example, the latest New Zealand Health Survey says one in three adults aged 15 years and over are classified as obese using the body mass index. The World Health Organization follows suit, saying in 2016, more than 1.9 billion adults aged 18 years and older were overweight. Of those, 650 million were obese. Here's Dr. Francesco Branca. He's the Director of Nutrition, Health and Development at the World Health Organization. So, I mean, of course, the easiest thing to do is to measure uh, weight and height of people. Uh, if you are an athlete with a you know big muscle mass, then that body mass index is a is a less uh, good predictor of the amount um, of 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 fat. And there is also a variability between different populations. So, um, a person um, of uh, um, Asian or South Asian uh, an ancestry. Um, a, at a certain level of BMI, is more body fat than the same person uh, coming from Europe, for example. So, so body mass index is a proxy of the amount of fat, but it's not a very accurate proxy. But still, you know, it's a good starting point for a primary care doctor. Then we can do better, and a good measure of that is actually the circumference of waist. You know, having more fat in that area, which is closer to the um, to the uh, liver, and that's where you know it starts uh, having an impact uh, on the metabolic response. You know that fat deposition is um, an additional element that leads from you know having a certain amount of fat to creating an impact uh, on on health. Actually, there is a, a new newly recent established uh, Lancet Commission that is looking at diagnostics of obesity and trying to consider um, what would be the best measure. But in reality, more than the physical measure, I think the diagnosis of obesity should be looking at, first and foremost, at the anthropometry, the distribution of fat, and then trying to look at the, somehow what is the impact on people's life. So, body mass index has been used to measure fatness in populations. But BMI just doesn't cut it when we're talking about health risk or visceral fat. That's the fat that wraps itself around our vital organs, like our liver, heart and kidneys. It releases inflammatory proteins that can cause high cholesterol, heart disease, stroke and diabetes. To complicate things further, straight-sized people, remember those are people who fit roughly New Zealand shops between sizes 6 and 16, are equally at risk of this visceral fat. Here's Dr. Brian Betty. He's a family doctor and chair of General Practice New Zealand. So there is a very, very famous photo of two public health physicians. I think they're an Indian in the UK, exactly the same BMI of 22, but one at very high risk of potential cardiovascular risk because when a CT was done on both of them, had high, very high, what we call intra-abdominal fat, which isn't visible. Um, versus the other patient. Now, you can't tell that. So ways have been looked at to try and work out who's at risk and who's not because, you know, there is a profound difference between what we call subcutaneous fat, which is fat under the skin, versus fat that sits around the liver, the pancreas, and the stomach within the abdomen. And we know that that fat sets up inflammation, which can lead to increased cardiovascular risk and increased risk of diabetes as well, which are often the main drivers for poor outcome with obesity. 
So, yeah, there, there, there's real questions about how we measure weight. There's real questions how we measure this thing we call a, obesity. Um, and certainly BMI is is acknowledged to be a very rough guide in a lot of cases, predominantly because we can't measure intra-abdominal fat hmm, without a CT scan. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So this visceral or abdominal fat can be measured, but it isn't. BMI has been the tool used in obesity research and obesity pandemic campaigns for the last 30 years, and it's still universally used. Remember, it's thanks to the obesity pandemic that we've got so much concern around fatness and health. There's clearly an attachment to the BMI, but why? Brian says it has its uses. Look, to be honest, to be blunt, having that information is really important in things like calculating cardiovascular risk because, look, there is a risk uh, associated with, with weight. So, you know, we need to acknowledge that. There's a risk of diabetes with weight. We, we need to acknowledge that. It's not the only risk, but it's certainly a, 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 a large factor. So these things are important in terms like calculating risk. We, we can do things like cardiovascular risk assessments, for instance. So we can do a whole lot of parameters like blood pressure, sugars, uh, weight, BMI. Um, do you have kidney dysfunction? A whole lot of factors. You can crunch into a very validated tool and pop out with a number that says, well, you're a high risk of a heart attack in the next five years. And actually what that does is give me as a clinician information to start to work with. We take it as fact that BMI tells the whole story, but we're talking statistics, not individuals. Why use a crude measure like BMI when we can actually test a person for diabetes, high cholesterol and high blood pressure? Health equity researcher Leslie Gray has a lot of thoughts on this. So when you look at a population and you say population-wise, you are more likely to have a higher risk of X, Y and Z if your body mass index is within this bracket or that bracket. That's true. But then we do tend to extract that back to the individual that is sat with you or sat in front of you. And it's very dangerous to then extrapolate an individual's health risk purely on the basis of a height and a weight. So when you look at health conditions like cardiovascular risk and diabetes risk, there are population level increased risks for those people that have higher body mass. Now, for some of those people, and if we think just about type 2 diabetes, that's one of the reasons why people believe um, high body mass is purely lifestyle related. And it's not. That's rubbish. It's about access to so many um, different kinds of foods, how you work, what stress levels you're under, your sleep, whether you have quality sleep, how much income your family's got, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But many of the things that relate to high body mass also associate with the likes of diabetes type 2. So we do see associations, but whether one or the other is the cause, um, that's yet to be seen. In other words, just because B follows A, it doesn't mean A caused B. We may be jumping to conclusions here. What's more, a lot of the research used by decision makers uses this BMI measure, and some of it is self-reported, which in the context of reporting my age, my friends will definitely tell you I've had more than three 30th birthdays. There was a, a study done, it's about bias, that says drinking coffee causes cancer. But actually, back in the day, you were likely to be having a coffee and a cigarette. So if you adjusted for those people that smoked versus those people that were having a coffee, then chances are it wasn't actually the coffee that was causing the um, cancer. It was more likely to be the cigarette. But just at a headline level, that could be interpreted from some of the data. So it's not to say the data is incorrect per se, it's just more complicated, and it's how we interpret it that's the problem. And Leslie Gray's seen that ramp up when pandemics like bird flu and COVID-19 have been thrown into the mix. With H1N1 and indeed COVID-19, people came out with statistical probability at population level, which showed that people with higher body mass were more likely to be at higher risk. 
And then there's also um, people with higher body mass who may also have um, worse symptoms. So we tend to take it as read that if there's going to be a, a pandemic, then people with higher body mass might be at higher risk and might have worse experience of the um, pandemic. The majority of global COVID-19 deaths have been in countries where many people are obese, a worldwide study found on Thursday, with coronavirus fatality rates 10 times higher in nations where at least 50% of adults are overweight. Rewind back to 2016, when a group of researchers questioned the link between bird flu, fatness and higher risk. They did a what's called a meta-analysis. And if you took out some of the issues, they could actually show that higher BMI wasn't even a feature. So, for example, one of the things that they factored out was whether people had early or late access to treatments. And if they took out people's access to treatment, then the risk for high body mass disappeared. So, in other words, there's an access and equity issue around the treatments that meant that these people were showing up in the statistics just by using body mass index. And that happens a lot. But when you actually look at what's not being measured, so people's access to care, people's ability to pay for care, people's health status before a pandemic versus during a pandemic, people's living situations, et cetera, et cetera. If you start adjusting for those things quite quickly in many circumstances, the risk of body mass itself disappears. So what's the problem here? Here's Dr. Francesco Branca again from the World Health Organization. Of course, you know, we have the responsiveness of our body due to the genetic background. We also have, um, you know, access to healthcare, which is different. So it's very important also to understand another important element about obesity. It actually is associated to um, socioeconomic characteristics of the population. In um, uh, high and middle income countries, it is actually those who are who have less resources. So you have higher rates of obesity in lower income groups, lower income groups and uh, lower income neighborhoods. Francesco Branca highlights issues around healthcare, income, employment barriers, and genetics. Yep, that old chestnut. When we talk about costs on the health system, what's not included in the conversation is prejudice by healthcare workers that holds patients back from getting the treatment they need. Or worse, under or misdiagnosis leading to early and avoidable death. What's more, could this obsession with the obesity epidemic be causing harm or even health problems? Here's George Parker. They're a lecturer in health service delivery at Victoria University of Wellington. They've also worked as a policy analyst and a midwife. And over the years of my career, not, not so much in clinical midwifery practice, uh, but in my time working as a health policy analyst, um, uh, over the 2000s, I, I saw this kind of, well, we globally and particularly in, in Western countries like Aotearoa, we saw this you know, explosion of interest and concern with obesity and uh, and and it had such an enormous impact not only on health policy but also health service delivery and people's understandings and mentalities around health. The former US Surgeon General Richard Carmona remembers that explosion well. He helped orchestrate it. As I look at the childhood obesity epidemic, and it was tough to get traction on that. Let me tell you, my, my, my predecessor, David Satcher, started, and it was tough. I picked up the baton from him when I took over office from David, and we struggled to get traction. Because at a time when we're at war, at a time when there's so many competing interests, obesity really isn't a sexy thing. But I had to be smart as Surgeon General, and I started learning that it wasn't always about the science, it's how you spin that science. So when you present childhood obesity as an issue of itself from science, sometimes falls on deaf ears. Now it's beginning to resonate. But when I, one day at a press conference, 
uh, so frustrated because everybody wanted to talk about anthrax and terrorism, and a reporter inadvertently in a room this size filled with reporters said to me, well, Surgeon General, what is the most challenging problem that you're facing? Of course, this is after 9-11 and anthrax. I said, obesity, dead silence. Nobody knew what to ask me. And they said, why? I said, because it's the terror within. That resonated. Got in every paper. Surgeon General says this is a terror, and equated it to terrorism. But I says it is because... Obviously, we need to take action against our enemies for bad things that have happened and all of that. I said, but I'm telling you, 9 million children today are overweight or obese, and they, in fact, are deteriorating before your eyes. That clip's from 2008. In an earlier part of his talk, Carmona discussed social determinants of health. These are factors like distribution of income, wealth, influence, and power that influence health risks. But it's his parallels to 9-11 that took hold, and contributed to what's been considered as the war on obesity. Back to health service delivery researcher George Parker. So I, I can't claim that the science is wrong, but I can claim that how uh, the science was taken up and enacted in health policy and in health care delivery to pregnant people and, and birthing parents was absolutely uh, not constructive and was actively harmful. The obesity epidemic was a, like a rock star public health issue. It was all over the media. It was all over the policy agenda. I was sitting at, at my desk at Women's Health Action as their senior policy analyst, and I saw this article in the Dominion Post in it. It was a reporting on the perinatal maternal and morbidity uh, report that year. And it was the first time I read uh, making a very kind of dark link between uh, experiences of stillbirth and the fatness of the birthing parent and the reports kind of suggested that obesity was to blame was the underlying driver for for some stillbirth outcomes and I remember just having an emotional response to that so you can see this real concentration of kind of quite oppressive and harmful discourses about the possible consequences of being fat whilst having a baby uh, right on the backs of people going through a really big time in your life. This response formed the basis for George's PhD thesis which asked whether this concern with obesity improved health outcomes. They found it absolutely did not and was based on flawed logic around fatness. Yeah, I can think of one participant who, who described appalling treatment uh, from her midwife, uh, abusive treatment, being called uh, piggy and being told to come on piggy, get on the scales. Uh, so many of our participants described uh, being called a big girl. Uh, oh, you're a big girl, aren't you? Being on showing to have ultrasound scans, being going, you know, being made to feel utterly ashamed. And then you have the filters down, just uh, much more kind of implicit bias, just not ever having the equipment needed to care for a fat body. Uh, participants feeling like there was just annoyance at them, that that fat bodies were warmly welcomed and cared for in the system, that that people were uh, just an extra burden, uh, you know, disgust sometimes, comments at handover, uh, and that so much of that, that quite fat phobic or fat shaming behaviour was legitimised by the idea that a maternal obesity was an individual life choice and it was a terribly harmful thing uh, for health. And so... You see that that's where that kind of moral and value judgment thing kind of piggybacks on to the legitimacy afforded to something when we when we claim it as a health issue and we don't kind of critically uh, analyze or, or, or assess it. Our next story today is about a smoldering public health crisis, obesity. It's not just a health epidemic, it's also an economic time bomb. And this concerns all of us. The numbers are not looking good, unfortunately. Experts say this is an alarming trend. Obesity rates are up again, increasing the risk for a number of serious and deadly conditions. And doctors say the situation locally is very concerning. 
2 million Kiwis will be considered clinically obese within 20 years if current trends continue, according to new research released today. High body mass index has already overtaken tobacco as the greatest contributor to health loss in New Zealand, and this ballooning obesity epidemic will play havoc. We're so concerned with finding links to diabetes and other illnesses that it's overshadowing the effect oversimplified measures like BMI have on the very people it's trying to serve. I should mention that the World Health Organization has extensively highlighted the impact of stigma and prejudice, but whether that's recognized in a New Zealand context, we'll find out in episode seven. So there's an issue with how we're measuring fatness, and there are issues with how we're interpreting data relating to fatness. And already we're seeing that it's much more nuanced than, you know, calories in, calories out. Here's Waikato University's Dr. Rebecca Graham. She's an expert in food insecurity. There's been such a drive by so many researchers and medical people that obesity is terrible, that obesity in and of itself is just the worst. We have an obesity epidemic and all of this uh, moral panic around obesity. And our politicians seem happy to reinforce the idea that fatness equals bad, and it's the responsibility of individuals, not society, to put it right. Remember this from Judith Collins back in 2020? What are you making calls in the wake of your comments to make discrimination based on weight illegal? Oh, come on. Look, um, you know, many of us can do better on this. I tell you what, uh, take some personal responsibility. And some have called your comments heartless. Do you know what is heartless? Is actually thinking that someone else can cure these issues. We can all take personal responsibility and we all have to own up to our little weaknesses on these matters. Thank so you, you think obesity is a weakness? Yes, generally. It's, it's the one that many of us do. We actually entirely have to take personal responsibility. Do not blame <laughs> systems for personal choices. Rebecca Graham says individuals have little chance over a broken system. It's the underlying issues around access to resources, around access to secure housing, around access to sufficient food for health and well-being. Uh, and we avoid, oh gosh, we avoid talking about racism too. We avoid talking about all of these underlying stigmas that exist and the impact of those on people's health and well-being. Otherwise, it's completely absent. And so, hence, it's often easier to say to people who are obese, oh, you're the problem. You just need to behave differently. You just need to make better choices. Our society is fine. Our society doesn't have any issues. Our society doesn't need to change. But actually, our society does need to change. But that's a lot harder in many ways because it means that those of us who are part of society need to do things differently because people like me don't want to turn that lens back on themselves and go, oh, I need to do things differently. I need to change my attitudes. I need to change my practice. Could it be that focusing on individuals relieves politicians, businesses and regulators from actively addressing these harms? I plan to find out. I'm Sasha Borisenko, and that was episode one of Chewing the Facts. It was written, directed, and produced by me. Executive producer was Teresa Cowie from Connect Content. Post-production and sound design was by Oliver Devlin. Theme music by Thomas Lambert, with special thanks to Andrew Laxon, Ethan Sills, and many more. Follow Chewing the Facts on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts. Then there's Instagram, TikTok at ChewingTheFactsNZ. New episodes are out every Sunday. This podcast was made in collaboration with the New Zealand Herald with support by New Zealand On Air. In the next episode, I'll sink my teeth into some hard-hitting journalism talking to my mum about life as an Irish immigrant child in America during the exciting genesis of the processed food movement. Growing up, did you notice that there was an influx in this type of food? Yes. And we wanted it. (laughs) When the um, TV dinners came in, oh, that was magical. To have your food in little compartments and 
We had card tables and little TV dinner trays and to eat in the living room was also special. We'll discuss the science of why some people gain weight and others don't, and the idea that genetics loads the gun. Food environment pulls the trigger. See ya.